Okay, everyone, welcome to Hermeneutics TH502, TH100. We, we have less. I'm sure more people will join us as we continue, but never fear. If people cannot, if you cannot make it, we have YouTube. So I don't know if some of you checked out the YouTube from last week. But we'll always have, I, I will try to post it as soon as I can, but we'll always have that backup. So if you have to leave the class, if you have to come late, the only requirement is that if you, if you miss more than 25 minutes at any time, I want you to watch all the time that you miss. So you don't have to watch the whole class over again, but you need to watch the time that you miss. And the purpose for that is really so that you're up to date with what's going on. You're really getting that content, okay? All right, let, let's go ahead and, uh, one second here. Okay, let's go ahead and open a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing the power back on. We give you the glory, the honor, the praise. We, we recognize that we can only do, uh, we can do nothing without you. And so we, we give this night to you. We give this evening to you, Father God. I just pray right now for the students as uh, no doubt they're a little stressed. No doubt they feel overwhelmed. Father God, you are the God of peace. Your peace guards our hearts. It's, it's beyond understanding. And Father, I just pray that your peace would come upon the students, that they would not worry about the long term, not, not think about how they can do this, but just take each day um, while it's called today, Father. May we grow in grace. May we study. And, and really, Father, I, I hope and pray that we would just learn uh, how to interpret your word, not for our pride, not for our glory, Father, but because we want to know what you have said. We want to hear from your spirit, and we know that your spirit works through your word, Father. So I pray now for tonight, we commit this time to you. May it be a time of encouragement. May it be a time of understanding. And may it also be a time, Father, where we uh, believe. May this create belief within us, and may we leave this classroom transformed and just desire to grow deeper and deeper in our understanding of your word so that we can love you with all our heart, mind, and soul and we can love our neighbor as ourselves. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are ready to go. And uh, let me just, uh, we'll just, what we'll do is we'll work through this PowerPoint here. And at each, as we work through the PowerPoint, we'll, we'll touch on the different aspects that no doubt you have. So questions about the homework, uh, the reading, and, and whatnot. So I'm getting some messaging so can um pastor henry can you just monitor the facebook chat if someone is asking a question uh and then if, if or if someone's trying to get in i think people can just enter without without me without me but if someone is having an issue trying to get a hold of me just just if you can just kind of monitor that on the side i, I uh, that would be a great help okay so let's just let's just work through the, this powerpoint slide so this is session number two, overview of interpreting the word method and history of interpretation. So two goals for tonight is really going through the, the, the method and also the history of interpretation. So just an overview of what we'll be doing tonight in our session. Uh, number one, we are gonna go over the questions you have from the homework. So many of you turned in the homeworks some are still turning it in some still have to and, and part of that is because maybe there's confusion so i want to go through the different documents that the examples questions you have that will be the first agenda for tonight uh, number two i do want to go through our our interpreting the word concise method we're going to be going back through that method and unpacking different things throughout the class but i want i do want to give you an overview of the method because you will start using that method. You'll, I want you to start thinking about the method as you prepare your sermon or as you begin to prepare your exegetical paper. So I do want to give you a bird's eye view of the method. And I really want to, I want to inculcate that in your mind. I want you to be thinking as you prepare devotionals, as you prepare sermons, as you teach small group, I want you to be thinking this method. Um, uh, and, 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 and I think that it will really transform the way you do Bible study. I am fully convinced that everyone's Bible study, everyone's small group will vastly improve. Your sermons will vastly improve um, be, because the method is text-based. It's text-focused. It's teaching us. We're not 
using it, if that makes sense. We're not putting our opinions into the text. We're allowing the text through this method to teach us, and then it just will speak to us. And then and you, I, I hope that you'll see that, especially by the end of the semester. But, but I, I do want to give you a teaser tonight. I want, I want you to see that, that big picture. Uh, number three, we're going to review the reading. So some of you read, some of you did not. Uh, fair enough. We are going to go through the reading because the reading is important. And there'll be some purposes as to why you'll see why the history of interpretation is important. It is important for us to consider. Um, and then that's, that's reviewing the reading. So we'll be asking, we'll be discussing the reading. I know some of you haven't yet turned in the reading, but hopefully you're at least, you've engaged with the reading. And this is for the TH-502. So the TH-100 students, you don't, have, you don't have this required reading, but the benefit of you sitting in, number one is that you get to learn. You get to, you get to experience the benefits of those who suffered through the reading. Uh, but it's important, it's really important. And then also, Again, no promises, I can't promise anything, but for TH100 students, if you attend all the lectures and you wanted to continue on to the MA, again, no promises, but I'm trying to think about, you know, long-term planning a way to where if you wanted to do an MA, it's not redoing TH502, all the work, but you've already had part of the assignments, you've already had part of, the, you've already had the lectures, doing personal studies to get the rest of that, that uh, course requirements, and then you can get the MA. So again, no promises. For non-accredited, that will happen, but with the accreditation, we have to think through that. But again, so, so even though you're not at the MA level, I want you to really be involved in this, because if ever you chose to, be, to, to, to move on to the MA or after you get your certificate, you wanna go deeper, you've already done half the work and I'm not we would not make you do that work again. We, we, we would just want you to do the balance of the work that you have not yet done. So uh, really thinking about that. And so even though you're not assigned the, the reading, listening in and learning from the reading is gonna be incredibly beneficial for you as well. And then lastly, new homework. <laughs> so that's, we're gonna go over the new homework for next week. And so let's go ahead. Uh, questions from the homework. So um, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through the homework and I'll give, I'll give the, I'll pop up the example, assignment number one. So the first part of the instructions here, this is just single space giving you instructions. And then the example here is the, the way I want you to prepare all your assignments, okay? Unless there's paragraph, we have an example of paragraph. But the reason for this is that this really, this format is very easy uh, for, for gathering the information, the assignment. It's, it's just, it's easy to grade, it's easy to, to, to catalog. So um, uh, some of you have struggled with this. This should be single space, right aligned. Single space, right aligned. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm just gonna give, I'm gonna actually go into the Word document to show you how to do this. It's very important to follow this nomenclature. So it'd be number one, it's easy, it's easy to grade, it's easy to catalog, and it's easy to, to get the information in the future, okay? So er, the first thing everyone needs to do is that you need to go, if you're using Word, you need to go to format paragraph. So if, if, if you struggled with the spacing, this will be a time to take notes. You wanna to go to the format and paragraph, and you need to make sure that for the spacing, if everyone can see down here, the, the spacing under, uh, just under this automatically adjust, the before and after needs to be zero point. Zero point, so, you, so zero point single spacing here, okay? That, because then you can adjust later, all right? So it needs to be zero point before and after, so then it will look like this. And then you need to make sure that this would be left aligned. If you can look up here, left aligned, you need to do right aligned. So you're, you're, you're aligning it with the right side, okay? <clears throat> then down here in the question second section, it needs to be double space. And the reason for it being double space is that if I need to make a comment, I'm not writing over your text. I can write in that margin. So that's why it always has to be double space. So what you can just do is highlight here and then you can click 
to, to this is line spacing. You can go, you can go to 2.0. There's the line spacing. Or, or you can go back up to the format, the format, and you can go back to paragraph like we did before. And then here, line spacing is now double. It's now double, okay? But again, all of whether you're writing a paragraph in so, certain assignments, it has to be double spaced so that I can write in the margins and you can still see your text. Okay, so it has to be double spaced. So some of you are doing, some of you were doing uh, double here, single here. Some of you were, so again, I'm not taking any points off for that, but we need to follow this nomenclature, this rubric uh, for, for style, for form, and also um, for cataloging and then for grading purposes. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the first major I think people had issues on. The, the, next, the next thing that I think people were struggling with is this, uh, um, the journal article and author. You, if you wanted to read the article, I mean, my desire was for you to, to pick an article that you liked and you could read it. But that was, the assignment was just to download it because I want you to be practicing with logging in using the cloud research tool and accessing theology on the web. Okay, so you don't have to read this journal article, but you need to post what the article was and the author so I know that you did it. Okay, um, same thing here. Uh, just, you, you just want to pick up a, a, a one to three passages of scripture. And for the most part, I haven't denied anybody. I've, I've given you your first pick. Um, uh, any, so, so that's for the first assignment. Any questions about this first assignment now that I've kind of worked through it? Does anyone have any questions? Me. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Because I typed in TH100. Yeah. And can I, can I change it to TH500? Yeah, 502. Sure. Okay, so, so, so are you enrolled? So the first thing is your program. Are, are you enrolled in the MA, Mark? Yes, professors do. Okay, yeah. So, so I was noticing that too. So, yeah. So you can still enroll in the in TH five hundred two. Mark, do me a favor and resend me your assignment with with that. Okay, make that change okay. after class. I'll just wait. I'll just wait for you, and um, make that change. The other thing too is some of you were not entering your program. I just assumed if you typed in TH one hundred that you are enrolled in the CT. The Certificate of Theology would be TH100. The, the Master of Arts in Theology would be TH502. So most were enrolling in the TH100 completely fine, but I'm, re I'm recording that your program was certificate, I mean, it was certificate of Theology. So if that's different, if you typed in TH100, but you want to do the MA502, I mean the MA degree program, you need to email me that clarification. And then we need to change it to the 502, TH 502. It just needs to be consistent. CT is for TH 100. Uh, TH 502 is for the MA, non-accredited and accredited, okay? Great question, Mark. Anyone else want to add? Thank you, Pastor Tim. The, the other thing was that some, what I'm going to do is, we talked about this before class started. For all the assignments, those who turned in great, if you can turn in your assignment early, that's actually to your advantage because right now I had so many come through, so it's going to take me a while to get it back to you. If you, if you send it to me early, it's like the only one on my spool, and I get it right back to you right away. So just think about that. If you wait until the last minute to submit, it's still, if it's still on time, that's fine, but it's going to take longer for me to get it back to you than if, let's say, you submit it a day or two days early. It can even come back within a half an hour because – there's nothing in my email. So that's just a, an FYI. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was, yeah, so I'm going to push back all the assignments. If you're still turning in your assignment or you're making adjustments, just go ahead and submit it tomorrow. So the cutoff is tomorrow, 6 p.m. I'm giving everyone 24 hours, okay? Nothing will be late, all right? But moving forward, we need to, we need to get back to that schedule. But because of things were being sent late, et cetera, et cetera, what we'll just do is I'm going to give everyone 24 hours to make adjustment. If you wanted to resubmit an assignment you were unsure about or you want to make a modification, that's completely fine as well. Okay, great. Uh, any, any other questions about the assignment for this? I think that's pretty much it. The, the one other thing is that some people were 
copying and pasting their verses. And, and I just, um, I know that the requirement was not to, to write it out or to copy and paste. I just, because I really want us to be doing our own work, I'm not permitting any copying and pasting whatsoever. That's just a higher standard. If you're, if you're gonna write out a verse or something, you just have to type it. it that's just to make it easy, there's no, so um, no copying and pasting, all right? So I am gonna be a stickler on that. So you can just type it out. A anyone, any other questions for this? You, you can raise your hand. Let's go now to the second, um, the second part, which is the reflection reading. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the reflection reading. So again, this is an example, okay? So there, I think there was some confusion. Some people thought it was applying to the journal article. Some people thought it was applying to this. They were actually interacting with this, this article that I was summarizing. This is specifically for the, the TH-502 students, and this is concerning the required reading. There's, there's sections of required reading. So the required reading for this week that was due tonight was chapter two, History of Interpretation from Introduction to Biblical uh, Hermeneutics. Okay, so this was just a separate example I was giving you. This has nothing to do, I shouldn't say nothing to do, this is concerning biblical hermeneutics, but it's, it's just an example that I'm looking for. So if you, if you can look for a moment in this example, I just picked a quotation that was significant to me. And I really, it really resonated with me. I liked the quotation, I agreed with it. So I just, I just typed out the quotation. And actually, I'm not requiring this, but I really recommend this. If you, if you want to develop in your critical thinking, in your interaction, if you give me the quotation that you like and then commentate on it, I can, when I read your assignment, I can give you feedback. That's a great observation. Or, or may, maybe, maybe you're being a little unfair here. But, but the benefit there is you're, I'm able to give you, uh, assess your, your, your and, and help you to develop your, your reasoning ability, your ability to, to, to interact with text. Now, I'm not going to take off points, but I, I, but, but I, can, help, I can help you. And, and that's what my teachers would do as well. Part of the, the purpose of this is to help us to think critically, to help us to read something and to assess. Is this correct? Is this misleading? Is this fair? Um, because there's, there's so much information in the world today, and we need to be a good assessor. So, so yeah, my recommendation, though I'm not requiring it, is just find a quotation that you really like or something that's said quote it and then interact with it. That's, that's what I'm doing here. I'm interacting with it. I did a little more than four sentences. Uh, and, then, um, and then I can also, I can also interact with you. And then the second part here is just something that maybe you disagree with, maybe you thought was missing that should be there. Maybe it's something additional. And so again, um, you should write it in such a way that it's professional, it's not attacking, it's not aggressive, it's, it's very tempered. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, still giving the benefit of the doubt. So I also want us to develop our ability to agree to disagree or to respond in a very professional, non-confrontational way. Because it's easy just like, I don't like this. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Stuff like that, right? It's like, he needs to go back to school. He doesn't, you know, he's missing this or that. Like, that's just our, that's our, uh, our flesh. But as professionals, we would not do that in the workplace, and we shouldn't do this in the church either. And so I also want to be, I want you to be developing your ability to uh, critique in a graceful manner, critique in a very graceful manner, okay? And so that's kind of the purpose there. And then the third is just, just a question or just some type of comment of further investigation of, of, of something that you're unsure about. And so again, it's just helping us to think critically. And that's essentially what I'm looking for. So, so you could theoretically in the reading pick the first five, the first five or the first pair, you know, whatever it is. It, 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 just pick one thing, one quote in, in the reading, interact with it, pick something you disagree. There's a lot to disagree with, right? History of interpretation. There is a lot that you're like, wow, what were these people thinking? Um, uh, but we'll discuss that in, in the future. So that's, that's kind of, um, that was the approach. Any questions? Any questions? Is that making sense? Okay, great. 
let's move on. I think that makes sense. So that, so those are the two homework assignments. Okay, great. Let's move on here. Good. I think it's, I think it's self-explanatory. Uh, for number one and number two, the quotation, could it be the same or it should be different? It should be. So it could be the same in the sense that you're agreeing with it, but you want a further clarification. Um, or you could partially agree with it. So you say, I agree with this portion and disagree. For the most part though, I think it should be different. If it's a really big quotation, it can be the same, but I, I'm thinking you really want to something, the idea is something I really agree with and then just yeah. explain and then one that you really disagree with or, or you, you're skeptical. Let's just say you're, you're cautious, you're cautious, that's good. Great, great question. Anyone else? Okay, let's go ahead, let's go ahead. Great questions, great comment. Um, great. All right, let's 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 move on here. Um, all right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to work through the interpreting the word method. So what I first want to do is I want to bring this up on the screen so that you can see this method. This everyone everyone should have this method. Everyone should have this method. It's posted on the Facebook group page. I don't know if Boboy has it, so I'm going to email it to you, Boboy. <laughs> I don't know if I said it to you. So, but here, I'm just going to read through this and then I have in the PowerPoint, we're going to just unpack each one of these ideas very quickly. We will be coming back to this again and again throughout the semester. And I want to first say that uh, there are different methods. There are different variations to this. I, I pick methods and kind of combining, making it my own. No doubt in next year, I might change it. I might tweak it. It's, it's a work in progress. But at least we have a, a roadmap. This is a GPS going from uh, the, the original text to, to, to application, preaching, teaching, or Bible study, or counseling, something along those lines. Okay, so this is to help us think logically, critically. I want to I say, Mon Capitid, that it's so easy for us we have an idea, we have an illustration, we have a, uh, a thought, we have a passage that we really like, and then we spend all the time trying to come up with great illustrations, we spend all the time trying to think how can we make this work, what passage can I use, and, and what ends up happening among the is that we're spending all the time trying to make something original, and what I found, especially in my own life, the more time I spend in the text, you find so many profound truths and there's no pressure. There's no pressure in the sense that you're, you're letting the text speak to you and you don't have that pressure of trying to come up with something original. You're just, you're just taking those truths, those, those, those investigative truths that you find and you're just putting them before the people. And someone will say, that's the most profound truth, Pastor. How'd you come up with that? I read the text. <laughs> you know, so, so it, it, it sounds very simple, but I'm telling you right now, the more you spend in just the process, in unpacking, you're, going to, you're just going to be amazed. You'll have people say, wow, that's so profound. And, and you can say, literally, it's not my own original idea. It's just, I saw it in the text. I identified it in the text. And so, I want us to get to that place, Mon Capitan, because for me, I used to sweat bullets trying to come up with a profound sermon, and I would stress, and then after the sermon, I'm like, is that really what the text says? Are people, and, and there was like a moment where it changed, it clicked in my mind, where it was just like, no, I'm just going to spend my time studying the text, come what may, I don't have to be original, I just have to be faithful to the text, and then the, there's so much information, it makes sense, people are like, that's what the text says. And it's, it's not me, Mama Kapitan, it's really not. It's just, that is what the, the word of God is so deep. And so the more we can just let the text teach us, the easy it will be for all of us. So let's just go ahead and work through this really quick. So the steps, we're all guilty here. We don't always do this, but number one, pray. Pray for wisdom, pray for guidance, ask for the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's the number one thing that we should do. Number two, we should uh, select your passage. So um, there's going to be specific criteria in selecting a passage because depending upon your context, depending upon, upon your audience, you do need to be wise in the length of passage you select, the, 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 the depth, 
of, of the passage you will go. And so there, there is somewhat of a science to selecting a passage, okay? Um, number three, location in salvation history. Location in salvation history. Where is your text in relationship to the death, uh, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension and exaltation of the Christ? That is so fundamental, how you approach the text. There are commands that Jesus gives his disciples that we will never fulfill. Jesus tells, right, some, don't reveal who I am. My time is not yet come. Can you imagine preaching like we should not reveal the Messiah because, you know, because just directly applying Jesus' commands. Uh, maybe he gave a command because he had not yet been glorified. Uh, um, what about commands in the Old Testament with the prophets? There's some crazy commands in the prophets. There's some crazy commands in the Old Testament. So it's very important for you to be aware, where are you in relation, where are you in salvation history? Where are you in salvation history, right? Um, so we'll, we'll unpack that more. Number three, genre identification. What kind of genre is your passage? What kind of genre is your passage? You have to understand that. You cannot approach a parable like epistolary. You cannot. You, uh, a parable that's teaching uh, one, it's a physical story teaching one spiritual truth. And you'll hear like a, a pastor teaching like five or six truths. And it's like, last time I checked a parable is one, <laughs> maybe two, right? And so we really have to understand the genre, prophetic and visionary genre is going to be approached so much different, again, than even gospel. So we really have to be careful of what genre. You have to be aware of the kind of genre that you're, of your passage. Uh, number, number four, background study. So, so many people, they will preach. Now, sometimes you can't. Maybe there's very limited information in the background. Fair enough. But I, you're amazed at how many people do not understand the authorship, the audience, the purpose of the book, the problems in the, in the situation of the, of the book, and people just ignore that. And many times that really addresses a lot of the issues in their text. And so doing a background study is incredibly helpful. Um, next, we have uh, a passage location. Passage location. So you need to understand where your the passage is is located. Number six, questions. Uh, you need to be a good questioner. Some of us are very good at asking questions. Some some of us are not so. So we really need to be good at that. Uh, number seven, uh, observations. Uh, and we're going to go into more depth tonight on 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 different observations. Uh, number eight, word studies. Defining words, looking for word reference. That's very important. Structure analysis. Um, <laughs> again, if you're in a narrative, you're going to have a different structure than if you're going to have an epistolary. Uh, how many of us are applying stru a structure analysis in the sermon that we're going to teach? And many people will say to me, how do we prepare our outline? Follow the structure. So we're going to look at that. Uh, uh, creating an exegetical outline and summary, and we'll talk through what that looks like. And so uh, once we're done with observation, we now have explanation. So once we've done these, we've done these studies, we've done this research, now we have to synthesize it. We have to bring it together. And so we'll discuss listing theological truths, listing Christological truths. Maybe there aren't so many in, in present, but we always need to be considering that. We need to exposit the text. We need to explain the text in our own words. If you can't explain the text in your own words, you'll never be able to preach it. So people that just, yeah, it's very important. Um, uh, creating a theological outline, creating a theological summary, that's the portion of really explaining. So before you can apply, you have to first observe, then you have to explain. Once you, once you explain, you're very... Once you explain, you, you really have a good grasp. Then we go to application. <laughs> now you can come up with your illustrations. And Mother Cuppet, I want to say this. Uh, if, we, if we come to this place, if we've done all our work beforehand, the applications will just, they will just 
appear. They will just appear out of thin air. And so creating a big idea, looking at how our text relates to Christ in the gospel, creating a homiletical outline, creating a good introduction. People do the introduction first. People do the introduction first. It should be last. You write the introduction and conclusion last. Once you really understand the text, you do those things last, okay? And then we have the tools, and we've looked at these tools before. So um, this, is the big, this is the big picture. This is the big picture. And um, uh, so we're just moving from, we're moving from uh, uh, observation to explanation to application, okay? Uh, any comments or questions before we get in? Uh, maybe perhaps you're thinking I missed something. Maybe maybe you think something else should be included. Okay, cool. All right. So now now we're gonna go into it. So now you had the big picture. Now we're gonna just work through these points. Okay. So I'm going to further explain some of these, all of these points, so that you have a better idea. And then so and then we're gonna do it again in the semester. Okay. So I really want multiple touches. I want you to be really uh, saturating, getting this into your into your thinking. Uh, uh, we have architects here. We have engineers here. We have attorneys here. We have some doctors in our class. Diba, there's procedure. There's procedure for different circumstances. There's different problem solving procedures. This, the same is true in theology. The same is true in preaching and teaching. This, imagine this being your, your procedure. Let's get into the specific points now, okay? So right now we're looking at observe it. So the first major point is observe it, okay? What do we have here? Spiritual preparation, okay? And so I have just some, some specific comments for, for you to consider. We need to, we need to pray. We also need to ask for wisdom and discernment. Uh, James says, you, you do not have because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss. And so sometimes the reason that we don't have clarity in a passage is that we don't ask for wisdom and discernment. So we need to pray for wisdom and discernment. We need to pray for God to speak through his word and his spirit. And one other thing in here that I don't have listed, but something else is we, we also need to confess our sin before we approach the Word of God. The Word of God also says if we, if we have sin in our heart, God will not hear us. And so also having a time of confession and repenting, repentance, is very important before we go into this procedure. And we all fall short. I fall short. We all fall short. But we need to be... Uh, we need to be viewing the word of God with reverence. With, um, and so I would say pray, ask for wisdom, ask for God to speak, and then also confess and repent from any, any known sin in our heart. And, and perhaps there's unknown sins. Um, uh, I think Kuya Alex just preached on Psalm 19, uh, guard me from those, those hidden sins. Uh, I'm messing up the passage in, in Psalm 19, uh, 11 to 14. But also pray for those, un, those unknown sins that, that are still present nonetheless in our, in, our, in our hearts. Next, we have passage selection. So now what I, we, we, we are going to select a passage of Scripture. And here's just some... Again, some ideas. You're already selecting your passages. So far, you've been selecting great passages. So, so in, in one sense, you've already done the assignment here. But as you prepare, as, as you preach, as you teach, uh, one thing we need to do is we need to remove all preconceived notions of what the text says. You must remove it. Uh, if, you're going, if you're going to the text with a preconceived notion, you are going to try to force the text to support that. And that's a recipe for uh, eisegesis. That is, we're reading something into the text, not pulling out. And so you really just need, maybe that can be part of your prayer. Father, please remove all preconceived notions. Let the text speak to me. Perhaps that can be part of the prayer. Uh, something else, 
remove all applicational plans. <laughs> set that aside. As much as possible, set that aside. Don't worry about what your introduction is going to sound like. Don't worry about your conclusion. Don't worry about an amazing uh, story you have. Set that aside. Maybe that will fit. Maybe that won't fit. Set it aside. And lastly, I just want to emphasize this. Let the text speak. <laughs> let the text speak. Okay, let's, let's move on here. So the next step we have is location and salvation history. Location and salvation history. And so this is very important for us to be aware of where we are in relationship to the coming of Christ. Are we... Uh, the question that you want to ask is, where is your text located in relationship to the Christ? And there's, there's several eras. You can have more. You can have less. You know, I've, I've just chosen these. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to promote a, a framework. I'm just trying to, to, to look at the big eras, the big eras in, in history. And so you have pre-Abrahamic era. Pre-Abrahamic era is really Genesis 1 to 11. That, that's the beginning of creation. In there, you have a lot of prototypes. The first, you have the first sin. You have the first covenant. You have the first judgment. You have several judgments, actually. Uh, but it's prototype. You have the first calling upon the name of the Lord. So you have, you have the first salvation events in, in, uh, in Noah, right? So there's a lot of prototypes. But but, but pre-Abrahamic is going to be very different than, than other eras. You need to be aware of that. Uh, Pre-Old Covenant era. So this is the patriarchs. This is sometime between Genesis 12 before Exodus, really Exodus 15. Because after Exodus 15 is really when the law is given. God starts giving explicit statutes to, to uh, the Israelites. But, but pre-Old Covenant era, pre-Old Covenant era is, again, significant. That, that, uh, that's going to be, that's a different era than with the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law, okay? And then, of course, you have the Old Covenant era, okay? You have the Old Covenant era. And that's from Exodus 15, the salvation from, 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 from Egypt all the way, all the way, all the way. When does the Old Covenant era end? Anyone can answer the question. When does it end? Old Covenant era after that is the birth of Jesus. Well, so is Jesus still part of the Old Covenant? No. Not. After that. Yeah, after. So, when Jesus says, this is the blood of, of the New Covenant that is poured out for many. Do this in remembrance. So, really, the, the, the New Covenant is inaugurated with with the, the, the sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus. So, so, you know, some will say at the sacrifice, Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit, there's a little bit of gray area there. But really, what I'm trying to emphasize is Jesus still was obedient to the Mosaic Law. He was giving teaching for the, for, it's transitionary, fair enough. So, so but, but, um, but, yeah, it's really the Old Covenant era. There's even overlap. You buy the Jews still practice the Old Covenant, but with the, with the sacrifice of, of Jesus, I, I, the, the sacrifice and resurrection of the Messiah, that's really the, the dividing line with the new covenant. Once that sacrifice is done, and once he's vindicated, when Christ is raised from the dead, he is vindicated by the Father. He is proven, declared to be the Son of God in holiness, through the, through the Holy Spirit, in power. <laughs> right? Romans 1, 1 to 5. And so... Um, uh, that's something people don't really, Jesus is still part of that old covenant era, even though he, even though John is that last prophet and then Jesus comes on the scene, he's proclaiming the kingdom, but he's still part of it until he gives the sacrifice. And then of course we have the, uh, we have the, the new covenant, sorry, we have the life of ministry. There's that, tr it's, it, there is this transitionary, um, even though the old covenant era ends with the sacrifice, Jesus' life and ministry is still, it's not the same as the Old Covenant, and yet it's not, it's a transitionary time period. So we need to look at that with a special uh, perspective, if that makes sense. Um, and then we have 
the new covenant. So new covenant era, post-cross, post-death, post-resurrection, exaltation of Christ. And again, there's, 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 uh, there's more details we can go into this. There's different ways of, of structuring this. Um, my point is not to get into a debate concerning all the different precise views of structuring. My main concern is the relationship with respect to Old and New Covenants and with respect to, 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 to Messiah. Promise compared to fulfillment. Okay, promise compared to fulfillment. Great. Let's, let's move on here. The next we have is, uh, actually it's 651. So let's take our first break. Pastor Henry had a question about point number three about salvation history. And he asked if it's going to be, if we will be investigating it in the big story of the Bible. And that is correct. So uh, we will be looking at those major eras. We'll be looking at foundational texts of promise and then also of fulfillment of the Christ. And so that's a plug for our other class if you want to join it. So, um, yeah, just be, be thinking about that. You can audit it. You can also take it for credit. You can watch the videos on YouTube. But, yeah, we will be really unpacking salvation history. Salvation history is looking back. The Bible's big story is just another, another way of, of also talking about salvation history. How salvation was given to us in history. So, uh, great comment. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue now. Let's, get, let's continue. And um, the, next, the next point that we're, we're looking at is, so once we have, we've, uh, we're now, once we have looked at uh, where our text is in relationship to, to, to salvation history, where, where, where Christ is in relation to Christ, especially his death, his resurrection, his exaltation, the next thing we want to do is we want to identify the genre. What is the genre of your passage? So there's two, there's two layers here to be thinking about. What is the genre of your specific passage? And what is the genre of your book? Okay, those are two different, those are two different, typically the, the, the genre is within like a subgenre. There, there could be subgenres. And I don't want to go too technical there, but uh, so for example, pistolary, that's the easiest genre. It's like one-to-one. -one. It's very easy. But you could be in, in, in gospel, in a gospel genre, the gospels, and that, that could be narrative, it could be parable. There's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different possibilities there. And so just to give some example, the examples of the different genres, epistolary, that's typically very easy. Gospel is its unique genre, and we'll discuss that later in the semester. Gospel is actually, it's unique. It's a unique genre. That's, of course, debated. Later, we have the historical narrative. We, uh, that, that's both, especially in the Old Testament, we have some historical narrative in Acts as well. Uh, uh, poetry. So a poetic genre. Poetic genre is, is its own unique genre, and you, you, you have to be very sensitive to, to imagery, to... To, it's not the same as you would approach epistolary or even the Gospels. And then, of course, parabolic. And people get into a lot of trouble with parabolic genre because they're thinking that the text, uh, in, in parabolic genre and in, in parables, there's only one truth being taught. And, and the problem is when people try to apply several different theological truths, to, a, to a, a parabolic genre that's only meant to be teaching one truth. The same is true in, 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 in like an a, a, a imagery or a metaphor that Jesus is teaching. A lot of times in Jesus' uh, sermons, he's using one imagery that he's trying to convey, one metaphor, and then people are applying so many different ideas or theological truths from one metaphor, and it's inappropriate. What, one one important metaphor is like we are the vine he is the uh, we are the branches he is the vine and then he, there's there's the description of of taking apart the branches and and burning them and so people have all these different views on all these different theological truths and it's really because they don't understand the single image that's being taught there and, and we can unpack that later but people get into problems because they're not they're applying epistolary genre uh, they're applying epistolary methods 
in a parabolic genre, it's inappropriate. It's not, it's not appropriate. And so that's why a lot of uh, heresy, a lot of heresy is, is, is developed because <laughs> we don't understand. Uh, next, prophetic. So there's also prophetic. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Prophetic is very difficult. It's very difficult, but it's, once you understand how prophetic genre works, it's very rewarding. Uh, moving along here, background study. So right now, uh, 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 background study is very important. And so uh, why is it so important to identify what's the, what's the benefit? Uh, and we talked about that a little bit a couple of minutes ago. The authorship, the audience, the purpose of the book is very important. Uh, contextual issues are incredibly important. And also date and location. And there are other things as well. And so, um, any, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments here? Everything's making sense? So, background studies are very important. They're, they're very important um, for us to be in preparation to approach our text that we're studying. Uh, the next thing is questions. And so here, what, one thing that I've really discovered, when, when I say, when I say we need to ask questions about the text um, that you need to understand or your audience needs to understand. Okay, so these, uh, one thing that I've really, I've really discovered is that when I'll ask people to ask questions, they're asking application questions, they're maybe asking, they're asking tangential questions, they're not getting to the root. They're, they're asking peripheral questions and they're not just looking at the text itself. And so the questions we need to be asking primarily is who, what, when, where, why, how, for what purpose. And it has to be related to the direct, the, the text itself, not peripheral issues. And so um, we can be good and bad questioning questioners. Um, you'll see this in politics, especially in the, uh, you'll see this in, in um, I can't really speak to, 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 to Philippine politics, but in the U.S. there's there's times where they'll bring people before Congress to answer questions, and sometimes Congress is prepared with good questions, and other times they're not, and so there'll be commentary on whether or not good questions were asked, and so someone could be guilty um, but not the right questions were asked and they were able to escape. <laughs> and so we want to be good questioners. We need to develop our questioning skill, our investigation skill. The best investigators, the best, the best uh, prosecutors, uh, uh, attorney Borja can speak to this, are those that ask really good questions that get to the heart of the issue. And so we need to develop that. Um, next, we need to deal with uh, observations. And so observations, uh, just a quick definition, an, an observation is a remark or statement or comment about some fact of information that is seen in a particular biblical passage or text. And so we need to be good observers. We need to be good observers. And so you're going to say to me, Tim, well, what do you observe? What are types of things that we observe? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Here are some types of observations that we need to be looking at. So if you, have a, if you want to write these down, this would be very helpful. Uh, repetitive words. So if you, if you identify a repetitive word, that's going to be very significant. You need to either investigate it or it's, it's really highlighting a main idea. You see repetitive words in narrative and, and in poetry. And so those repetitive words are clues as to what the author is uh, emphasizing. Contrasts, negative and positives, opposites, polar opposites. So contrasts are very important. You need to identify them. What are the contrasts? Are they present? Comparisons. What are things being compared to? So there's a relationship, and if it's in the comparison, sometimes it's spiritual to physical, sometimes it's physical to spiritual. And so comparisons are very important to identify. Lists. So if there, there's a list, we need to identify why is the list there? What is the, what is the purpose behind the list? Uh, cause and effect relationships, or we could say inference. There's a description and then there's an effect. There's a cause and then there's effect. Uh, declarations. 
So what is being declared? It could be a, a, a prophetic declaration of some profound truth or some profound warning. Um, verb actions. Verb, verbs and action words are the fundamental uh, components of, of sentences. So you have to identify the verbs. What kind of, is it a command? Is it a promise? Is it an action? Is it a state? Those are, there's so many different things. Objects, subjects, who's the one doing the action? Who's the one receiving the action? An object receives the action, the actor uh, does the action. <laughs> Sometimes it's God, it's, it's, God is the actor, whether implied or, or present, and we're, we're, not, we're not aware of that. Uh, conjunctions, very important, giving relationships. A uh, pronoun antecedent. What is the, the, the pronoun identify? Who is it identifying? Blessings. Question answer. Sometimes there's actual question and answers in the text. Means or agency. It's the, the means by which, the agent by which something is carried out. The means or the agent. It's the, it could be the instrument by which an action is, is carried out. Purpose and result. We are called to do certain things for what purpose or with what result. So you need to identify those things. That's part of the observation process. Uh, doxologies. Uh, how often do we just skim over doxologies? And so doxologies literally is, is to, to attribute glory, to attribute. Uh, in the New Testament, you have doxologies given to God the Father and Jesus. And, and that is even uh, uh, an implicit way of declaring Jesus to be God or to be equal to the Father by attributing a doxology to, to the Son and not just to the Father. So doxologies are very important. Inference, commands, promises, conditions, emotions, warnings. What else? So those are tons of, I just gave you so many different kinds of observations that we, we need to be making. And this is all directly related with what the text is saying. It's not application. You're really looking to try to identify all the significances that you, that you need to bring together to then, to then explain and then apply. Any comments or questions? I just gave a lot of information. Any comments or questions? I'll, I'll just pause. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can post on the chat. I have a question and I'll recognize you. Go ahead, Pastor Henry. Of this, uh, you mentioned about from one to seven until observations. In, so that it will be clear for us. Yeah. Can you can can you apply it? Uh, can you apply a passage where where it, we can sink in? What's the uh, this is the spiritual preparation passage, something like that. Yeah. So so what we're going to do, Henry? Great question. Is right now I'm just I'm I'm giving you the the method and I'm giving you just the things to be looking for so that you can start doing this on your own. We're going to apply this to several different passages throughout the semester. So we will just, we will apply this method so that you can see this in action. Okay, so right now I'm just, I'm trying to give you the, the big picture and all those different things so that you can start doing this now. So yeah, great, great question. And we will be, for sure, we'll be going through this multiple times. I hope by the end of the semester, it's maybe not second nature, but yeah, great, great question. Anyone else want to ask? Good. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I, I, I see people. I don't see anyone writing. Now. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, when it comes to observation, is there, is there, uh, rather, what is your warning when it comes to making observations on a particular passage or word in the scripture? Yeah. Okay. No, great question. So the, the difference between a question and an observation is an observation is a fact. Okay, if, if you're making an interpretation, if you're making a conclusion, so I'll give one example, okay? So if it says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, uh, that love, that when you look at the, the Greek or the Hebrew, in English, it's not as clear, but that's a command. So that's a fact. You can't say that's a promise. It's a command. It's very clear. The form is a command. So you would identify this sentence, it, it contains the action is a command. Okay, so that's, that's a fact. All right. Now, if you were to say, if you were to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, your heart, mind, and soul, that means your whole being. 
that's now an interpretation to say that heart, mind, and soul means your whole being. Now you're interpreting. Okay, so you you cannot make an observation. What you would say is, what is the significance of the three different, the list? And then you would investigate, and then you would discover it's a merism, and then, okay, you, during explanation, you're answering the question, and it's loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul is a command, and it means to love the Lord your God with your whole being. Okay, so that's the difference between a question and then research and then, then interpretation or, or explanation and just a fact. In one instance, it's clear that it's not, not negotiable. Um, the other, it, it could be in, an interpretation. So that's really, if, if it's in any way unclear or if it seems to be like an inference. So for example, uh, for, I'll give another example. Okay, so in Romans, Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay. So, so if I were to say this means that if you don't believe you're going to go to hell, that's already a conclusion. That's not an observation. Okay. The observation is that everyone who believes will be saved. That's an observation to make the inference. Those who don't believe go to hell now, that's an appropriate inference. I'm not disagreeing with that inference, but that's no longer an observation. Now you're moving into the realm of developing theological truth, okay? So yeah, that, those are two examples. And, we'll, and you'll see this more and more. A lot of times people confuse theological conclusions with observations. And that's really where the debate comes. That's really where, yeah. And then you can deal with essential doctrine, non-essential doctrine, yeah, views on salvation, views, yeah, so that, that's no longer in the realm of observation. So, Bunga Kapitid, the big takeaway here is that um, uh, <clears throat> we, need to, we need to clearly separate between the clear, explicit commands and teachings of Scripture and then theological inference, okay? And so there's a, there's a big confusion there. So the gospel, non-negotiable, clear. The precise timing of the return of Christ, interpretation. <laughs> so that's where we need to be separating the foundational non-negotiable truths and, and, and the more interpretative conclusions. And so I just gave three examples there, and you'll see more and more. And, 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 and you also see people that can't differentiate between the two. It's very difficult to reason with them because... They're bringing it, it's, it's whatever they think is all one. It's all observation, and it's not. There's, there's, there's hard facts, there's brute facts, and then there's interpretation. So great question, excellent clarification and questions. And, and again, we're at the very beginning, so maybe this is overwhelming to you. Please don't be stressed. I'm just, in, this is an introduction to love, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and move on. Um, someone's asking about a screenshot. Maybe I'll post, maybe I'll post this. I'll post this on the Facebook. I'll, I'll post this list on the Facebook uh, group page later. Uh, okay, next, word study. So word study. Word study is uh, defining or clarifying a word or phrase's meaning. So sometimes it might be clear to you or might be clear in the context, but but for your listeners, for your readers, it's not clear. So you need to identify the words in your passage that you're going to be studying, those words that need to be defined either for your benefit or for your reader's benefit. And so the way we would do this is we'd use a lexicon or a dictionary. Um, words, every word, every phrase has a range of meaning. Every word or phrase has a range of meaning. Rarely is there one meaning. And your job is to choose the meaning that best fits the context. So one mistake of a lot of uh, interpreters and preachers is they will look up the word and there's like five different meanings or nuances. And you're like, wow, I like them all. And they list them. <laughs> and it's like, what does the word mean? It means all of these. Well, no, 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 no. It, it, it's going to mean one in a particular context. Uh, sometimes, rarely, there will be several different 
meanings, okay? Sometimes there's two possible meanings, but most of the time it's, you'll have a range of meaning and then you're gonna pick the one that best fits the context, not what's the theologically the best, not the one that you like the best, it's the one that fits the best. And then you're going to defend it. So we will go back to this. Don't worry. We'll come back to this. You will pick your, your, your word choice, your definition, and then you must defend it. So Koya Bull Boy will love that. <laughs> you need to choose and then defend. Why did you make your decision? So uh, that will be part of your, your preparation, for uh, part of your sermon preparation. Again, you're going to see this is going to be so good for you. Um, Okay, next, next, uh, structure analysis, structure analysis. So this is probably going to be the hardest, this will probably be the hardest part of, of the process. Structure analysis is, the anal is an analysis of the structure within a sentence and beyond and consequently the argument of an author or it's the plot development of a narrative. And so what, uh, there's really three kinds of analysis that I'm gonna, work through with you. I hope that we can, again, I'm going to wet your whistle. Uh, I'm going to wet your appetite. I'm going to give you a snack. But, you know, I had a class in, 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 in seminary. It was Greek structure analysis, the whole class, Greek structure analysis, one class just here. So I will not do that to you, but maybe one day we will have just one class on structure analysis. Um, because there's different ways to approach different genres. It's not all the same. And so the three analysis that we will engage upon here is a, a, a grammatical analysis. So we're looking within the sentence. Grammatical analysis is within the sentence, looking at the different parts of speech within. So think about within. Inter-sentence analysis is outside the sentence. It's sentence to sentence relationship. And then a plot trace analysis is looking at narrative. So you can apply a plot trace to parables. You can apply it to historical narrative. Uh, you, can, you can even apply it to sermons, like, uh, like Stephen's sermon in Acts. I'm going to mess this up. Is it Acts 7 or Acts 6? I think it's Acts 7 is Stephen's sermon, right? Acts 7. And so uh, plot trace. So those are three different types of analysis. When you, we're gonna try each one. When you see it, it's gonna be like, oh, this is not so hard, I can do it. So uh, inter-sentence might be my hear up at first, but again, uh, we need to start practicing. It's gonna be stressful at first, maybe stressful for a long time, but throughout EBST, Certificate of Theology, Master of Arts in Theology, I hope, this is the first class, but I hope to continue each class, I'm going to somehow bring this in. Um, maybe each class, one of the assignments will be to prepare a sermon. And, and each time, I want you to be honing this skill. It will be hard, but by the end of your graduation with the certificate or with the MA, Manga Kapatid, Martin Luther said, what is theology? But grammar applied. <laughs> what is theology? Grammar applied. And for those who've already attended some of our courses this year, you've seen when we investigated Christology in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we're just applying the grammar. That's all we're doing. So much of theology is just applying the grammar. And so this is, this is the, the meat and potatoes. This is the ulam. This is the ulam. The ulam uh, and... Uh, Kanan, Ulam and Kanan. That's the the best part. This is this is the meat. You say U.S. meat and potatoes. You say Ulam at Kanan, diba. That's the. So we. I want my prayer is for us to become good at this. If you can master grammatical analysis, inter sentence analysis, plot trace, you can preach. Oh my goodness, you will be so happy. So that this is my prayer. Um. Okay, moving along here. Now we're into explaining it. So we're done the observation stage. One other thing I want to say, Mon Kapitan, is that this whole process, it seems very long. I, as a pastor, as a teacher, I cannot do this for every single text. But what I hope to do is I hope that you'll practice, and then once you become good at it, even if you can't, don't have time to do all the process, you're thinking. You're thinking through this. So like for me, if I have to prepare a devotional, I don't have time. I don't have 
five, six, seven hours to prepare. I still think through the process. I'll go to my resources and I'll just look at the background really quick. I'll look at the structure really quick, even just very quick. So again, not that you have to go through all the, but that you're thinking in these categories. You're just making quick observations. And Mama Competent, I'm telling you right now, it's a lot of work at first, but if you can start thinking like this, it will be very fast later. So again, I don't want, to, I don't want you to be stressed. I'm, I'm emphasizing to you, uh, it's a process. You'll be able to practice this so many times. Just slowly, just slowly uh, applying, just slowly putting into practice one or two and just adding like that, okay? Uh, list theological truths. So something else we do not do and we should be doing is once you've done all your research, once you've done the structure analysis, the word study, you're now in a place to move from what the text says to what the text means. What the text says to what the text means. Uh, or what are those eternal theological truths that, that are being taught by the text, okay? And so many times we just jump again to application, but you need to list out, list out what those theological truths are and you need to put them before your members. You need to put them before the church. Write out theological timeless truths that the text is teaching explicitly. Um, Write out theological timeless truths that the text is teaching implicitly or presupposed. So there is, so in the first category, it's primarily being taught. It's in the foreground. In the second, it's in the background. It's, it's a theological truth that must be present in order for the statement to be factually correct. So for example, in Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20, there's a, there's a reference to Jesus, all things being created uh, through him and for him. It's a reference to the, to, to the Son, okay? What, is in, what has to be true for that sentence to make sense is that Jesus is God, <laughs> that he is the eternal Son of God. So, so it's, uh, 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 that's not explicit. It doesn't say Jesus is, is, is the eternal son of God. He is God himself. But it's, 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 it, it's a foundation that has to be present in order for the statement to be true. Um, the just shall live by faith. The foundation that has to be true is that salvation is not by works. <laughs> the just shall live by faith is the statement. The foundation that must be, truth is, that must be true is that salvation is not by works. Okay, so there's, there's again, there's, uh, you can make inferences, there's foundational truths, but again, you need to present that before your people, and sometimes you need to make those clarifications so that they see that you're being faithful to the text. A background theological truth is not the same as a foreground, but both are foundational. Okay, both are true. Maybe we just assume these things, fair enough, but the more that we can identify between the two, it will really help you as you explain the text, as you answer people's questions. Um, it will be very helpful. Uh, next is list Christological truths. Write out theological timeless truths concerning Christ and the gospel. So Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I think chapter Chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, I think. Um, but his purpose was to know nothing except Christ and Christ crucified. And so every passage of Scripture, there would be a different relationship, but we always need to be coming back to what is the relationship? What are, if, what if, if there are, what are those truths concerning Christ and the gospel? We are here because of the gospel. We're here for the gospel. We're here to promote the gospel. We're here to proclaim the gospel. We're here to live in light of the gospel. And so what are we doing? Uh, we can just have dead orthodoxy when we give all the theological truths. What are, what are those life-giving truths about Christ and the gospel that are speaking to us? And so we always need to be asking that question. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's more. But sometimes they might not be present. Maybe it's a relationship, okay? But we always need to be thinking. We, immediately when we see the text, 
How does this relate to Christ? How is this in relationship to the gospel? How can I connect it to Christ? It, it, it's still being fair. We're not, we're going to see in the history that people have reinterpreted the gospel. Re, they've reinterpreted the text to, to bring out Christ and that's wrong. So we're not reinterpreting the text, but we're always looking at how it relates to Christ. We must always be aware. And so these passages of scripture, we don't have time to go there tonight. Maybe at the end of this, um, so well, Sigurado, later when we really unpack this in the semester, we will go to these passages. But I would just really encourage you to look up these passages on your own time. You can write them down. But these really give the, the foundation for what we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> sir, sir, please. Yeah, go ahead, Sonny. Uh, regarding with our, um, you know, word study, will you provide us a resources for, to where we can get uh, especially for us who are not really familiar with uh, original language like Hebrew and Greek, so uh, we are relying on the Bis Bisaya or or any vernacular language or the, the you know common language that we have or in English, particularly. Uh, yeah. Solely we are yeah we are you are relying on English. So um, regarding with the semantic range of a certain word uh, that has been. Uh, you know, used by the author. Or will you will you provide us a, um, a you know, a, a resource or resources yeah. for for that? So we so no, that's a great question, Sonny. And we have we already have. It's a Step Bible. So Step Bible is so powerful. Uh, it has the range of meaning in the Greek and the Hebrew, and you don't have to know Greek or Hebrew to really see that range of meaning. So we will have. Practice in step. I'm telling you, Step Bible is produced by Tyndale House, and uh, Tyndale House is top. It's top in the world for scholarship, and so um, we will. You will learn how to use Step Bible. So, great question. Yes, we will be providing with that, and um, uh, I'm actually going into assignment for this week. There's a video that I'm going to require you to read for, uh, re require you to watch for Step Bible, so that you really get acquainted with step bible and theology on the web you are going to eat breathe and sleep step bible and theology on the web and there's many other resources that you can refer to but i want you to master those two online resources and um yeah so great question excellent great great clarification as well okay let, let's go on here because i don't see any other questions um is that question for, did you post that question sonny or is that someone else okay next uh, exposit the text, exposit the text. So explain the text, including all the truths and definitions that you have researched. And so uh, before you can preach the text, now again, some people write out a manuscript and that's really exposi expositing the text. But before you preach the text, some people will, uh, some people will just practice saying it out, talking through it, that's fine. But before you preach the text, you really need to exposit it, write it, explain it in your own words. Because what will happen, Mung Kapitan, is that if you can't explain it or after you write it out, it doesn't make sense, then you can't preach it. <laughs> so, so again, this, is, this, this takes time and cigarette. You can't do this for every sermon. But if you're dealing with a very difficult passage of Scripture, I recommend if, you're, if, you're, if it's a difficulty, write it out. You can use your own vernacular. You can use Tagalog, Waray Waray. You can use Cebuhano. Write it out in your own words. And if it makes sense, and, and maybe read it to your wife. I read everything to my wife. Read it to someone else, and is, they, they will either say that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. And so um, this is a helpful way to prepare. And really, you're going to be doing this. I'm going to require you to do this in, in your sermon or your, your research paper. And so what you would do is you would go verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and you're going to write it in your own words, including your research points, your, your research points, those things that you've researched. Okay, and, you, and you'll see more how that, this is done in the future. Um, next, we have a theological outline. So maybe I missed the exegetical. So, so the, the structure analysis will, I missed the exegetical outline and exegetical summary. So 
once you've done your structure analysis, you're going to turn your structure analysis into an exegetical outline. And that just follows the structure that you've identified and you're, you're, you're stating the, the exegetical outline in the original context, okay? And then with the theological outline, you're going to take that exegetical outline in the original context and transform it, including those theological truths into universal truths. Okay, so this might be a little confusing. You'll see this, we'll, we'll, we'll practice through it, but it's just moving your exegetical outline, which is found, which is, which is formed from your structure analysis. You'll make an exegetical outline and then you'll make the theological outline. Again, I don't do four outlines. You'll see how homiletical it's gonna end up being four. I don't do four for my, when I preach, you can't, okay? But you need to practice the method so that you at least are understanding. And then when you are stuck in a difficult text, you can do that. Because working through the structure analysis, exegetical outline, theological outline, homiletical outline, really guards against misinterpreting the text. Okay? So, so I'll, give, I'll give more information in the future. This is just converting your exegetical outline into a theological outline. You're essentially removing the original context, the original author, audience, and you're, you're writing it in universal truths, timeless truths, okay? Um, there you go, timeless language, and timeless language, okay? So this is moving from an exegetical outline, what the text says, to, 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 to theology, okay? Again, this, is, this seems like so much work. Please uh, bear with me. Yeah, I'll uh, boy. Will you give us also the advantages or positive points of each of this method over the rest after you made an explanation of each one of these outlines? Um, I'm, I'm confused. You mean like compared to other methods? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, we can we can discuss the advantages and disadvantages. Um, yeah, we can we can we can do that. Yeah, we can do that at the end. Maybe not tonight, yeah. but sometime. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, of course. Later, maybe when you are done with this, maybe we can summarize what is the good point of this, the bad, the bad side, and the strong side, etc. Yeah, 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 yeah. After this is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can, yeah. we can do that. Yes, that, 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 that's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. See. Okay. Great, great question. Thank you. No problem. Great question. Good. Okay, let's let's move on here. Um, okay, last. So th so this is really in preparation for your homiletical outline. So you're moving from structure analysis to exegetical to then theological, and then this is the transition to homiletical. And then next we have a theological summary. So a theological summary is just taking the theological outline and then just putting it into one. This is converting your exegetical summary or you're uh, into a theological summary. And this is, um, yeah, so I, I, I did not include the exegetical summary. What, what, what it is essentially is it's just, you're summarizing your exegetical outline in one wordy, long sentence. It's very wordy, it's very long. You're trying to get, because this is moving towards your big idea. So I missed that, I, I, I apologize. My, for some reason, I'm missing a slide on the exegetical, but it's just the theological summary is essentially your outline in just one sentence. It's in one wordy sentence, and, and, and you'll see what it's like, because then what's going to happen is you're going to reduce this down into a, a big idea. It's going to be very easy to, 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 to your main proposition. You're just essentially taking your outline and you're just writing it out in one sentence. That's, that's all you're doing. It's gonna be very wordy, it's gonna be long. But again, it's helping you think through getting that big idea because what we're moving to Mangan Kapitan is we're moving from the text to one big idea that people will remember. Because when you preach, people will not remember everything. You're, we, want to, we want to get down to one idea, one subject and complement that people will remember. And, and the way we do that is, this seems very tedious, but we're getting to this, we're getting to this place where you have one idea, one big idea that captures it and will be memorable for your, for, for your audience. 
Okay, now we're on the application. So now we're gonna create the big idea. So, so in creating the big idea, you have to identify the subject. You have to identify, this is the, the main statement or truth that is being taught. Uh, and so by this point, everything is gonna be so clear. If you've done your homework, if you've done the process, boom, it's right there. It's gonna be so clear. It's just gonna appear before your eyes. It's gonna be really easy. So um, uh, you have a subject and then you also have a compliment. So your sentence, this big idea is going to have a subject and then you're gonna have a compliment. We need to study God's word, why? Because uh, there's great benefit or something like that. Um, we need to preach the gospel. Why? Because we're commanded to, something like that. So whatever the text is, you have, you have one main idea. Maybe it's a call to action. We need to pray every day. Why? Because we need, we're in relationship with, with God. So whatever it is, there's this subject that contains the main statement or truth, and then there's a compliment. This could be a means, this could be a how, this could be a why, this could be a purpose. So you're, you're creating a sentence with a call to action or a, a promise or an assurance and then some type of relationship, a reason, cause, a how-to, a wherefore. So it's this, it's this, it's this two-part proposition. What is, the, the, what is being taught, the complement to that main truth? So there's a main truth, and then there's a complement to that main truth. This could be a reason, it could be a means, it could be a purpose. So you're, you're looking at relationships. Okay, moving along here. I wanna finish this because we're almost ready for the last portion, uh, and then we'll take our break, okay? So Christ in the gospel. So once you have this big idea, now we're coming back again to Christ in the gospel because now in this application phase, you need to see in what way Christ and the gospel relate to the text. Christ and the gospel relate to the text in some way. And so at this place, you need to look at how Christ and the gospel relates. Let me just go back here. Um, how does Christ and the gospel relate to your text? And then I have some examples of how he relates. So how does he relate? Uh, so your text could be direct fulfillment. So you're in the Old Testament. It could be directly fulfillment of Christ. So maybe it's an Old Testament law. He fulfills the law. So maybe, maybe it's direct fulfillment. Uh, uh, it could be direct literal or it could be typological. So for example, Christ is the Passover lamb, right? The Old Testament doesn't literally say, although in, Psalm, in, in Isaiah 53, it refers to him as being a, a a sheep led to the slaughter, right? But concerning the Passover lamb, uh, it doesn't explicitly say in Exodus that he's the Passover lamb. In the New Testament, we see that in actuality, the Passover lamb was a type pointing to the greater Passover lamb, Christ. We see, we see the temple is a type pointing towards the greater temple, which is, of course, the temple of his body. Right? And then also... We, we're part of this temple. We're the, bo the body of Christ is also the temple. So the, the Old Testament temple is a type for uh, the New Testament temple uh, in Christ as the head and we as the body, okay? So there's many different types, right? There's many different types. And that, but in the Old Testament, again, these are, these are pictures. These are things that, that are pointing to the greater reality. A parallel in Christ's teaching. So there could be a parallel. It could be a parallel in Christ's teaching. So you need to, you need to pick up on that. You need to, you need to see, is, is this taught in Christ's teaching? And, and it may be connected in that way. Is there an illustration or an analogy in Christ's life? So this is where Mungu Kappa did. No, we never just take moral commands and directly apply it to our, to our members. We should always look to how Christ fulfills it, and then we use Christ as the example. We use Christ as the example. So uh, fulfilling God's law, obeying, obeying the Father, those are all illustrated in Christ's life. So we're called to, to pray, but we're called to, and we all fall short. I fall short of this. We need to be doing a better job of first 
when we give the illustration of calling people to maybe meditating on the word, praying, we first point towards Christ before we before anyone else. Christ prayed. Christ depended upon Christ trusted in, in, in God. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So Christ was Jesus Christ, the illustration or analogy in Christ's life, we all fall short. We need to really be drawing examples in Christ's ministry first. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, an example. So we have illustration, we have analogy, we also have an example. So they, they, it could be a direct example from Christ's life. And then, of course, there are direct moral commands still given by Christ. And so we have to look at those relationships. Maybe Christ has given us a direct moral command in, in, in relationship to what we're uh, our passage. Uh, these are these are different ways by which we are making the connection. And then, of course, direct commands by his apostles, and then also faith in Christ. So again, there's so many different ways by which we can bring Christ in. We can look to Christ. We can look to his him fulfilling. We can look to him commanding. We can look to him living. Most fundamentally, faith in Christ. Our passage should, no matter what we are teaching, the just shall live by faith. We are in union with Christ by faith. Every sermon, every sermon, every teaching should come back to the most fundamental truth in the Christian life is living by faith. And then there, once we have that, once we have, once we have the the big idea, once we have the connection with Christ, then we can create our homiletical outline. So now we're ready. We're ready. We have the theological outline. We have the big idea. We have how Christ and the gospel relate. Let's write the outline. This is it. Now we're ready to write the outline to preach or to teach. Convert your theological outline into a contextual homiletical outline speaking directly to your audience in their context. So now you're going to turn the eternal truths into, into a contextual. You're, you're applying it directly. What does this look like in your life? What does it look like in, in your local church? So this is where, this would look different in a U.S. church than in a Filipino church because you have different contextual issues. So I'll give one illustration. In speaking the truth in love, we talked about this earlier in I-Team and our things. We talked about the command to speak the truth in love, okay? And we talked about the difference contextually with, with, with a U.S. context and with the Filipino context. And what I said is, in this, in, if I was in a Filipino context, I would be emphasizing the need to speak truth because many times we're choosing relationship over truth. It's Contextually, relationship is, 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 is a little bit higher than truth. In the U.S. context, yeah, Americans will speak the truth, but there's no relationship. There's no love. So in American relationship, in, in American contextualizing, we're going to be emphasizing love. Speak the truth in love. So you see, you see how contextually you might, you might, it, it's different. The emphasis might be in speaking truth. The emphasis might be in Love as you speak the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is where this is where you can't just do the theological outline because you're not contextualizing it. <laughs> so we will work through that in this semester. And, and even Dr. Liz, Liz, I like he has a whole section on contextualizing. So it's not one size fits all, Mung Kapitid. It, it, tell the guy it's not. And even some churches, Mung Kapitid, it depends upon the church. A church that is always doing, 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 you need to emphasize grace. A church that is very lazy and just relaxed, you need to be emphasizing doing. So this is where contextualizing really comes into play. As a, as a pastor, as a leader, you need to identify the contextual issues in your local church, in your community, and you need to make those adjustments. You as the shepherd need to make the adjustments. As a small group leader, you need to make the adjustments. If your small group is always doing, 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 and, and maybe the families are being neglected, you need to call them to rest. If they're not doing, you need to call them to action. So this is really where contextualizing is so fundamental. The message will be lost if, if you do not focus on this part. 
but now it's the time. It's now it's the time to focus on the application. Um, and then of course, you, uh, some other things include in this homiletical outline, include illustrations, include analogies, uh, include other parallel passages. Now is the time to bring in the parallel passages of scripture that clarify, that exhort, that validate truths. So this is the time to really be bringing in those other texts. Um, people rush to the other texts first. That, that's, that's later. Mama ya, mama ya, right? So we need to be, now is the time to draw other parallel passages to clarify, to exhort, to validate. Now is the time to identify the illustrations, the analogies. This is the time, not at the beginning. Later, it's always later. Now is the time. And we're almost done and we'll take a break. So I, I, I appreciate your patience with me. And then lastly, lastly, uh, create an introduction. Create an introduction. Um, uh, the introduction should captivate your audience's attention and draw them in to hear about your solution. They sh it, it should captivate and draw them in to hear about the solution. And the, the introduction needs to be directly connected to the main idea. Uh, there is a sermon I heard um, before. It could be anywhere. Don't try to guess where it is. But I, it was on Hebrews 12, uh, 1 to 3. And I still remember it very vividly because the introduction focused upon the reliability of Scripture and the witness of believers. Okay? And it was about the, it was about the, the introduction was about the reliability of the scriptures and the witness of the believers. And what, what was being introduced, it was good. We need to emphasize the reliability of the scriptures. We need to I, I emphasize the witness of believers. But the problem that I had was it wasn't creating the need to really look at the text. Deba, Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 is, since therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside uh, every weight, every weight and every sin that easily entangles us and let us run the race with endurance, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our, of our faith, who um, endured the cross uh, and is seated at the right hand of God, blah, 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 blah right? And, but but the, the main point is to call, it's to call to run the race with endurance. And so the introduction should be like uh, talking about it's hard to run, right? When you're running a race, you want to quit. Like, well, like uh, you know, go, you, the, the, the introduction should have, the, the introduction should have been the difficulty of running. You know, I hate to run. I don't want to get up in the morning to run. My legs are tired. The sun is hot. Like, what are things that cause you to not run with endurance, right? So, so you, you're really resonating. The, the listener's like, yeah, I hate running. I hate running. And then it's like, we all hate running. And then that type of introduction, it, it draws everyone in, boom. And then you go right into the solution. You, 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 you go through the need to, to, to lay aside the weights, to, to, to lay aside those things that trip us up. So what I'm trying to get at is that we can – we, our introductions need to be directly connected with the problem that you're trying to solve. It needs to draw your audience in, and then that introduction creates the need for you then to give, to put before them the solution. Okay, so it has to be directly connected with th that big idea, okay? And then the same thing with the, the same thing with with the conclusion, the conclusion needs, uh, the conclusion causes the listener to reflect upon what he has learned and to call him to action. He needs to think about, reflect upon what he has learned, and he needs to be called to act. Now, uh, it's not always the action that you're thinking about. <laughs> it's not always the action that you're thinking about. Let me, let me explain here. Um, uh, what are the actions? What are the actions? Number one, <laughs> belief and trust. I, how many times have I commented, go do this? Yes, <laughs> but the most fu fundamental action that everyone should be called to is belief and trust. Fundamentally, 
The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Number two, the conclusion should call us to worship. It should call us to worship. We worship, we worship God with our whole beings. This idea of love. This is where we get the idea of love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is that worship. This is that adoration. Um, it should cause us, not in every situation, but someone who is sinning, it should cause us to confession. For those who are sinning, it should call us to confession. It should call us to repentance. So we can confess our sin, Diva. We can confess our sin, but we might not repent. <laughs> we might not repent from this sin. We might confess, but we won't repent. So, so again, we should be thinking about how does our conclusion call us to repentance? And then, of course, Mung Kapitid, it should call us to obedience. It should call us to obedience. So again, um, now, the, the thing I want to say is that the obedience might not always be physical. Sometimes the, the call is to know something. So sometimes Paul says, know this, right? James says, Know this, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of God is not producing the righteousness of God, right? But, but the, the call to action among Kabbalah is know this. It's no, it's not do, it's, it's no. What do you have to know? That you need to be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. Do you see that? So the obedience might not always be a physical command. It could be knowing something. It could be, it could be, thinking about something. It could be meditating upon something. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the, the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. <laughs> meditation! How, do we obey in our meditation? So again, we're done here. I, I hope that this is helpful. I want us to be thinking about these things, though. So I've this is to really give us, I, I, I've just given you the whole, I've given you, great. Uh, Roland says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Yes. And so th there is also that doing component. So you, you're right. It's, it's not just knowing, but, 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 but yeah, eventually you're coming to doing. But sometimes the emphasis is on the knowing part. Um, uh, but there is, James also talks about the doing just later on. And so Maybe the next sermon you you emphasize the doing part. So, yeah, absolutely, great great comment, uh, Roland. Um, so yeah, it's not to say it's not to say that the doing doesn't come later. But if you're emphasizing James, I think nineteen, one nineteen and twenty, uh, that emphasis for that part needs to be on on the knowing. Um, let's go ahead and take a break. I'm quite fascinated that structure analysis is under the category of observation. Yeah. I'm just fascinated how it is related with drafting an outline. Like, yeah. I've used, I was instructed before that starting, uh, starting a sermon, they want me to give first an outline. And structure analysis is under the category of observation. It's something that I hope you could I could appreciate more and enlighten us how it is connected with drafting an outline than the structure analysis. Yeah. So, so, so the, <clears throat> the homiletical outline comes last. You have the structure analysis. The structure analysis is the foundation for the exegetical out outline. The exegetical outline really is just is the, the structure in your own words, but it's, it's, it's describing what the structure is. Then once you have the exegetical outline, you create the theological outline. What are those eternal truths that are being taught? So, and then once you have that, then you move lastly to your homiletical outline, which is really bringing it back into context. So let me just, let me quickly draw something here. So if you can imagine. It, just, it, it creates a fine line from observation to application with the structure analysis. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, so, but... It's 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 a it's a it's a, a predecessor. It's the it's the preceding component. You have to lay the foundation first. Okay. 
Yeah, before, so here, let, let me just, let me, let me draw something for us. Let me just, can everyone see this? Okay, so uh, if you can imagine here, I'm gonna draw several things, okay? So, so firstly, I, we're gonna come back to this later, but think of this as a py pyramid. Exegesis is here. This is what the text says. Or so, so this is really um, the exegetical outline. Exegetical outline. Um, and then, and then this is moving from exegesis, you have theology. What it means. And then here you have application. Um, what it means in my context. So this is like timeless, timeless, timeless truth. So that so so this so this is this is the theological outline. And then this is the homiletical outline. So if, if you can imagine, if you're gonna start in like a building, if you start building the third floor without laying the foundation, you're like, ah, you have to start of here. Of yeah. course. Yeah, so, so and, and then here, this is really where, this is really where the structure analysis occurs. Okay. So, so okay. then, and then what happens that is, will do. yeah, go ahead. Uh, that kind of presentation with like a snapshot, okay, I get it. It's better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and let me just, I, I want to draw one. Yeah, good. Great. Okay. great answer. Thank you, Tim. Okay, no, no problem. I do want to draw one more illustration so you also see this. And this is also helpful. We're going to probably come back here in the semester, but what essentially you're doing is you're, you're looking at the, uh, this is the, you can imagine this is the uh, exegesis. This is the uh, original context here. And then you're moving to uh, theological. And this is timeless. And then you're contextualizing. And then this is homiletical. Mm -hmm. and, and the benefit here is that uh, homiletical, this is contemporary. This is, uh, ah, sorry. Contemporary context. So this is 20th century. This is Bible times. And, and this truth never changes. This never changes. So you have to, you have to assess. And then once you understand those truths that never change, you can then contextualize. If you don't uh, contextualize, if you don't understand this, you're going to get it wrong. You're always going to get it wrong. Yeah. So um, that's right. And, and because the, the difficulty is, people, yeah, no, no, that's that, that's good. And Alex, thank you for that question, and I, I really appreciate that 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 question. And um, yeah, there's debate. There's always debate here, and some, yeah. So we'll come back to this in the future. But great question. All right, any other questions? It's already eight fifteen. Let's, 
Yeah, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. And, and really appreciate the question, Alex. Really, really do. Um, let's take, okay, let's, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll go into the last portion, which is the, the theological reading of the, the history of interpretation. So, um, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll go into the last section of our, our session tonight. This is the reading that was due this week. So those of you who have read, I want you to participate. And, um, those who are in TH100, just listen along. Um, and, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and take our break. Okay, so Pastor Edwin had a great question. He asked about sharing notes. And uh, um, no, I agree that that, that that would be the easiest. But I do, in, in some ways, I want you to participate in the experience of taking notes. I have found that when you take notes, it does cause you to be more engaged. You ask questions. And... Um, what we'll do is eventually, once we work through the process, you, 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 I will be sharing my notes later. So, but um, one thing you can do is, again, because I want you to really experience the, the process, is that we will record this class like last week, and also we'll have the, um, I'll have the tags, I'll have the, 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 the timestamps. Yeah, so I'll have timestamps for each of these sections here on the YouTube video. So you can just click X, uh, observation, and then you and then you can watch th this part portion of the observation, the observe it, the explain it. You can watch those portions again. You can you can double check the video. You can screenshot the video. So um, and I'll go. Th I'll show you at the end of this class how to look at, at YouTube videos and see the timestamps. So we'll go through that. And also, I want to go through Facebook as well to show, to show everyone how to use the group. And, um, but great question, Pastor Edwin. And uh, um, if, this was just, if this was not a, a class, I would give the notes ahead of time. <laughs> I do want you to experience. So um, great. All right, so let's go ahead and let's do highlights from the reading. So highlights from History of Interpretation, Chapter 2. The reading for this past week for those in the TH502, which is History of Interpretation in Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard. And uh, let me just open up, let me go ahead and open up to questions uh, or comments. Those who had to do the reading, those who read, what were your observations or questions from, go ahead, let me unmute you. My first question, my first question is like this. Uh, from the start, the historical presentation, it seems there is one agreement that the Word of God is the Word of God and is the best interpreter of the Word of God. It is the Word itself. However, people came out with different idea how to interpret the Word for a certain reason and for a certain purpose. That's why we had this over time, different people come out with a different version, a different idea. Different. So my question is, to make it short, when we study this interpretation, are we looking into whether the previous interpretations were correct? Or are we still looking for a better interpretation of the Word of God? No, so that's really, so your question is, your question is great. No, that's an excellent question. I hope you put it in your reflection reading. Uh, which interpretation is correct, or are we looking for a better method? Are we just yes. looking to pick a method from history, or are we looking for a better method? Excellent. Yes. yes. Great question. So I'm not going to answer it right now. Let's think about that. If someone, if okay, someone okay. wants to yeah. make a comment, yeah. if, if someone wants okay. to, 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 to make a comment, go ahead and join in. But that's a great question, Koya Boy. Um, what yeah. other questions yeah. or observations that you had? I'll, I'll make a chart down here for observation. Anyone else want to add your questions or your observations from the reading? Okay, Henry Kwa. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, Henry's coming in. Hold on. Good. Okay, go ahead. Uh, my observation. Uh, the famous, uh, the source of interpretation comes, um, comes from the Siptuagin. Comes from the? Siptuagin. Yes, this were the 70 scholar, Jewish scholar who interpreted Egypt. But this was during the time of Alexander. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is in Alexandria. 
mm -hmm. Alexandria. In my observation was since this become a famous or the be, uh, the, the 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 foundation of numerous interpretation, but it seems sit sit what then they were influenced by the philosopher of the time, and it give an accurate interpretation. Yeah. So so no so. No, great, great observation. And then I guess it's also a question. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Observation and question. Okay. Can it be accurate? Great. No, that's really good. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to withhold my, my comment. No, but that's really good. That uh, for sure here, Diba, this is, this is leading to uh, um, like a, a allegorical interpretation, Diba. So that th this is also approaching scripture this way. So there's two there's two issues is what I'm trying to say. There's the translation to Greek. This is a and w for those who did not read, don't worry, we're going to discuss this. I, this will be in the PowerPoint. But this is a this is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, and. Uh, and then the, so this is one issue, Greek translation. And then the second one is allegorical interpretation, approaching scripture with this method. Great. Okay, so Sonny made a great observation. Sonny, I'll just read. So Sonny says, Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The reason for translation was that the Hellenistic Jews residing outside Jerusalem are no longer no, uh, they did not know Hebrew. And so the need for making this Greek translation, that's correct, is that you had Jews residing, Hellenistic Jews, Hellenistic means they were like Greek, they were Greek, uh, they, they were Greek Jews, if that makes sense. Um, they were living in Alexandria outside of Palestine, and they did not speak, they did not speak uh, Hebrew. They spoke Greek. And so there is a need for a different translation, just like here, there's a need for Tagalog, for Wardai Wardai, for Messiah. And so in the same way, you had Hebrews that were, were no longer speaking. So that was the need for writing of translating. And then connected with this, but separate, is this, this uh, allegorical interpretation. And so then Henry's question is, how is that accurate? How can it be accurate? And so that's a great question. Anyone else want to add who read? I don't know if anyone else read. I'm trying to think. Um, I know that um, uh, Ira, Ira, if you want to make a comment, no pressure, but you can. I want to give you the opportunity as well. Anyone else? Ah, okay, Sunny. Okay, let me get you connected. Hold on here. Where is Sunny at? Sunny wants to make a comment. Go ahead, Sunny. Oh, yeah. Uh, so regarding the questions of Kuya Boboy, uh, that's really a good question. Uh, it, it really hits the nerve of um, the issue of hermeneutics. <laughs> uh, the issue then is uh, uh, whether we, uh, as an interpreter of the scriptures, are we going to have a better interpretation in the future or or, or choosing what the, the author really says? So there is an issue of the reader's response and the, the intention of the author. And for a, yes, uh, evangelical Christians who believe that uh, the Bible is inspired uh, by God. Our task, uh, my comment to that is, I, our task is to is to seek the, the authorial intent, no? the intention of the authors, why he wrote this, uh, uh, why he wrote that certain books or the 66th book. Um, in order to do so, in order to trace the the the, 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 the intention of, of the author's meaning is to know the background of the book, the purpose, why the author, uh, from the author uh, tried to convey his reader uh, in the first century or, or, or the certain reader, uh, the recipients of, of the book, and, uh, uh, and also uh, to trace the situation of, of the, uh, the background and what, why, why the author prompted him to write the, uh, the, the book or the certain um, book of, of the scripture. So uh, the, the task of, of, of a real Christian, biblical, uh, biblical Christians or 
hermeneutics as I or exegete. Uh, that's why we, we call it exegesis because we, we draw out what what the, the the real meaning of the scripture, what what the author really means, uh, not just putting our, our you know our response or it's not it's not the reader's response is that that is important, but what the authors really uh, mean to say uh, in in his writing or the purpose of his writing. I think, I think uh, that's my comment and the way I observe the book also. That, so, so Sonny, are we looking? So, Sonny, you're, you seem to say that we're we're more focused on trying to to be in line with. I get, so I'm trying to clarify what you're saying. So, are you saying that looking at this new, better method, you're kind of relating it to this? Is that is that kind of what you're saying? So, you're you're saying more or less we should be focused more on um, uh, in a correct me if I'm wrong, like more tra traditional hermeneutical approach, I guess. I, I, maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding you. I unmuted you, so go ahead. Hang on. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with, with regarding to the yeah, traditional way of, of the hermeneutics, yes, uh, I would incline to what the conservative, um, you know, scholars are, are doing. Yeah. And so the difficulty, though, is that you have these different tr traditional approaches, correct? You have, yes. you have <laughs> yeah, the, the, the text, the text, the meaning of the text, or the author intents and the um, reader's response. I think that's the, the three main, uh, you know, you know, are are, are are viewing to what really hermeneutics looks like, or what what really means by hermeneutics. Yeah, our, our hermeneutics means. Uh, we we take the the author's intention of writing, uh, are are the text or or the meaning of the text, uh, the text it's, uh, itself or or the meaning of or we as a reader, the way we we interpret it or you know self interpretation so something like that so yeah but I I am more inclined on on the authorial intents of yeah um, yeah thing good. good okay good no that's that's good Sonny and I think I think there is when you look at the history of interpretation, there is a broad range of possibilities. And so, but at the same time, we're not saying, oh, they were all wrong. We have, we, we, we have the best, right? So uh, there, there needs to be a traditional approach, but we still need to make that decision. Um, great, anyone else wanna add before we go to the PowerPoint? Anyone else wanna add? Okay, let's go ahead and work through the PowerPoints. Oh, go ahead, uh, Bobo wants to say, hold on. Uh, was it Sunny? Sunny mentioned about and uh, Henry mentioned about the translation of the Bible from uh, the original text to to Greek, uh, the Septuagint. Uh, I am concerned, or rather, personally, I'm not concerned about the translation because there is also another translation to Latin, the Vulgate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I'm concerned, Tim, uh, Tim is was whether the translation, this is probably an observation, probably not a question. What I'm concerned is the relation of the translation or the purpose or the intent of the translation was intended primarily to suit a particular group of persons who do not understand the language of the original text. Most people do not understand Hebrew and even the Hebrews then do not, do not, do not uh, speak the Hebrews. Yeah. Even the Hebrews, the original Hebrews, they do not speak some of the Hebrews, but they speak Aramaic. That's why there was, uh, <laughs> there, had to be, there had to be a translation that was intended for the Hebrews or for the Hebrew-speaking Jews. And there was supposed to be a translation for the non-Hebrew-speaking Jews. Now, there is another group of people who neither speak Greek, neither speak Hebrews, but they speak Latin because at the time, Latin was the international language that came the, the Vulgate version. Later on, which is now very common throughout the world, there are English translations. Even the English, there is a King James. There are new NIV. So to me, the, the intention of translating is not the concern. To me, it's not the concern of hermeneutics. The concern is whether the translation is uh, intended only to a particular person or intended to suit an idea of the particular author. Probably that's what the concern of Sunny. Oh, when so the translation was made, was the concern 
the intention of the author or mainly to translate the language from one language to another. Yeah, no, that's great. Purpose of translation. So I think what you're yeah. saying is you're saying is that the the, the uh, so in in the uh, targums we're gonna look at the targums. It was both uh, translation and commentary, right? Translation yeah. and commentary. Yes. And commentary. It's more. It's more than just translation. And then even in the Septuagint. Now, just to be clear. The Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, that's accurate, that's literal. But then the rest, the rest is, is very much commentary paraphrase. People don't realize that. You had a paraphrase here, and you also had also had commentary as well in the in the in the Septuagint. If you read a Septuagint translation in English from the the, the Pentateuch, very accurate, almost the same as Greek, very similar. You go outside, especially in the prophets, it's like, whoa, what's going on? It's like, it's like commentary. It's so long, it's, it's added. So yeah, so th there's a different purpose by some of the, the translators. So, so that's the issue, I think. I think you're really drawing. That's good. Um, Henry is saying here, it seems that they're looking for defects or errors in former rather than to determine the meaning of the text. Yeah, and so there is that Qumran community, right? They're making yeah. changes to fit there. This is that. No, that's good. All right. Does anyone else want to add? Maybe let's just go through the PowerPoint and then we'll have more questions as we interact. How about that? Does that sound like a plan? Does anyone else want to add? Okay. I'm good. Good. Okay, so let's go through the PowerPoint. And um, okay, so um, history of the interpretative process. And so what we're going to do right now is we're looking at the purpose. So what now these notes here, for the most part, I mean, I, we're summarizing Blomberg, Hubbard's, and Klein's uh, perspective, secondary. Uh, that's their interpretation of history. So there is there could be debate. Some people would say I disagree with his assessment. Fair enough. So this, this portion is really, we're summarizing and discussing their assessment, their commentary on history. So I just offering that as a caveat in the, in the, in the sense that, um, you know, I've done some, a little bit of research in the past, not a lot. Should I do a lot of research in the history of her interpretation? I might disagree with some of the conclusions that they make. So I just want to add that as a caveat that we're really right now, uh, we're using them as a textbook, and so we're interacting with their assessment. They are interpreting and they're assessing. Um, for the most part, I agree. There was a couple times where I, I felt that it was their assessment was somewhat coming from their theological framework, and I, I wasn't 100%. You know, maybe I want to change some things. But again, because this is our textbook, we're just going to go with what they say. Okay. So what, what I'm meaning to say is that in the future, you say. Hey, Tim, you said that there, but now you're saying this. Well, in fairness, we're, we're really just interacting with them and we're, we're just taking their word for it, okay? And, and for the most part, I want to just emphasize it's a great book. Most, if not everything, I agreed with. A couple of things I felt like it was one of those things if I had a reflection paper, I would be like, ah, maybe you need to fix this here. So I just want to add that as a caveat. Um, so uh, purpose. So, they, so, so Klein, Hubbard, and Blomberg give several purposes for the benefits of looking at the history of interpretation. So why do we study the history of interpretation? Why is it important? Number one, it introduces key issues that are pertinent to the Bible interpretation, which in turn prepares the student to understand their approach to these issues that we present. So they're introducing key issues that are pertinent to Bible interpretation. So these are issues that are keep coming back. So these are not, uh, the famous statement is those who, those who do not uh, listen and remember history are bound to repeat it. Those who ignore history are bound to repeat it. So the same is true in the interpretation process. We need to be aware of the history so that we don't repeat it. Um, number two, it sensitizes readers to the opportunities and pitfalls of involving, of, of um, 
trying to contextualize the Bible teachings in the present. So, so there are many pitfalls, yet opportunities for contextualizing. We're going to see in the history of interpretation that the same was true, that there was, there was pitfalls, people fell, and also people were successful. Um, number three, uh, there is not, the knowledge of the history of interpretation should cultivate within us an attitude of humility toward the interpretative process. There should be this attitude of humility because we all fall short. We all make mistakes. Okay, so these are three purposes uh, that, that they provide us for the benefit of looking at the history of interpretation. Okay, so I'm just going to be very quick. Okay, so this is for those who are not taking this for credit. Um, uh, they're not doing TH-502. Just, just listen along. Maybe, maybe you'll see something that benefits you. Um, there's really, uh, there's several major uh, um, eras of interpretation that we're going to look at. Number one, Jewish interpretation. So you have an inner biblical illusion. You have post-biblical interpretation. So inner biblical we'll look at in a moment. You have post-biblical interpretation. You have this Hellenistic Judaism, which was already mentioned. That is uh, Greek Jews, Greek, Greek, Greekish Jews. That would be like saying Filipino Americans, something like that. Okay, um, the Qumran community, and also rabbinic Judaism, rabbinic Judaism. Okay, and number two, so looking at the history, you have this major era, this major, and some of these are kind of contemporaneous. So rabbinic Judaism is is somewhat contemporary contemporary of the apostolic period, although it begins way before, it continues on after. So there is some overlap here, although this is, this is a helpful, uh, helpful movement, but I just want to be clear, there is some overlap with rabbinic Judaism and the apostolic period, because rabbinic Judaism continues during, con, uh, is contemporary with, with the church. Um, then you have the patristic period. Patristic period is roughly 100 AD until 590 AD. During this period, you have the Apostolic Fathers, you have the Alexandrian School, and the Church Council. So again, um, uh, just big picture here. Then you have the Middle Ages, which is really 590 AD until 1500. So AD 500 until 1500. And then you have the, Re the Reformation, that's 1500 to 1650. You have the Post-Reformation period, 650 to 750. And then you have the Modern Era. And so this is really... These are the big eras of, of the, the history of interpretation of the Bible, okay? So just briefly looking at what is inner biblical illusion. So I'm just going to be very brief here. We're, we're not going to spend a lot of time. This is writers and editors of the Old Testament sought to revise, update, and amend or rewrite um, so that those sources, those source texts could address new challenges and new realities faced by each reviser's own generation and perhaps future ones. So the simplest example is uh, uh, in, in, in the Pentateuch, you have after the past Moses dies, and then the statement is, since the death of Moses, no one greater, no prophet arose that was greater than Moses. Obviously, Moses did not write that. He died. Okay, so some editor added in that emendation describing the greatness of Moses, and that was inspired. That was, that, we would, as conservatives, now liberals would say, no, that's, that's, that's clear that it's not inspired. But we would say, no, that's the, the spirit's still moving. The canon is, is open in the sense that God has not yet closed the canon. He's still speaking through prophets. Of course, he's speaking through Levites and scribes, and so um, uh, that's the case. Another example is, First and Second Chronicles is post-exilic. It's post-exile, after Israel has come back, whereas First and Second Kings most likely is pre-exilic. But yet, First and Second Chronicles is really looking back and interacting with First and Second Kings. And so there's some type of interrelationship here. And so there's this inner biblical illusion, okay? The, the same is also true um, of the prophets. The prophets are are interacting with the prophets and, and, and Psalms is interacting with the law. Proverbs is interacting with the law. These are written after the law and they're interacting with it. So again, this is inner biblical illusion. 
And so just to restate, the simplest of this is adding a brief parenthetical explanation, such as clarifying names, to the most complex being reinterpretation. I don't like the word reinterpretation. I think, you know, that's the word that they used. Um, you know, I, I prefer, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I guess it could be reinterpretation. You know, I, I, want, it, I want there to be a high view of scripture here um, because it's not that Kings was deficient and Chronicles is now correct. It's that Chronicles post-exilic is, is post-exile is offering complementary new information but through the spirit of God. Okay, so maybe complementary, the most complex is the, the complementary of first and second uh, Kings in first and second Chronicles, something like, like that line. Um, I, you know, there's debate here. So we're just summarizing what the, the authors are saying here. Um, uh, then, then the second movement is post-biblical interpretation. So here, this is really what, what, what Kuya Boboy is talking about and where we're going to get with, with Pastor Henry. Um, the first interpreters known by name were Levites who assisted Ezra, the scribe, on the solemn occasion that Nehemiah 8-7 reports. And so Ezra publicly read the Mosaic Law in Hebrew, and then the Levites explain it to the crowd in Aramaic. So Ezra reads Hebrew and Levites explain. So this is like, this is like in the Philippines, right? You have the missionary, the Korean missionary, maybe someone else preaching in English and Korean, and then the Filipino translating. <laughs> All the way back then, it's the same. It's the same. Nothing has changed. <laughs> um, and so this is where this is where the Targum originates. The Targum is a Aramaic translation of the Hebrew scriptures, but it's more. It's more than just a translation. It's a paraphrase, or we could also say it's a, a commentary. Okay, and so um, what is the purpose here? The purpose of these translators, the purpose of these—they're more than translators. They're they're scribes. They're 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 eventually rabbis. The purpose is to not only uh, translate so the people have the, the text, but they're also trying to teach. And so really, this is the predecessor. This is the prototype of our commentary, okay? In, in one sense, it's a, it's a prototype. It's, it's, um, I want to emphasize this, is that what, what in theology, in, in, in listing out theology, in, in, in doing commentary works, this is not something new. This is something that goes all the way back to post-biblical. I mean, this is intertestamental period. So when we say post-biblical, it's after the Old Testament, but before the New Testament. And then it, of course, runs concurrent with the New Testament as well. But what I want to emphasize here, Mon Capitan, is that some people talk about getting back to the simplistic church of no, of no you know, theology and just simple scripture reading. That's not the case, Mon Capitan. We have here an example of commentary. We have an example here of teaching. Uh, this is a fundamental aspect of our worship because uh, for, for many reasons, for many reasons. But I just want to highlight that the fact that the Targums maybe answered Bullboy's question, Queen Bullboy, it's not something bad. It's not something bad. Now, of course, there's mistakes, there's bad interpretations, but they're trying to, they're trying to teach the people. Uh, Alex has a has a question. Just bear with me a second, Alex. Let me find you here, Alex. I'm just wondering because okay, you're giving us resources that have some reservations, right? Uh, yeah. So, so the the reservation is 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 it's it's a qualification because th they're interacting with primary source. They're they're interacting with primary resources, and they're giving interpretation, and so. It's dealing with history, and so there's always an interpretation. So, so my qualification is just in the event that I were to do some of my own uh, primary research, and perhaps I disagree with something that they say. It's not like, well, Tim, you said this back in class. Well, w the reading is good; it's accurate, but it's it's fallible. There could be a mistake. I haven't double checked everything that the authors have said. We're just taking their word. So that's kind of my that's that's my caveat. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's really that authority out there that has some less uh, controversial interpretations or like, you know what I'm trying to say? Well, like, no, so, yeah, so, so this would be, this would be, I mean, so let me take a step back. So we're at the MA level for credit. This is required by CGST. So this reading is recommended by CGST. And I would say that this is probably as conservative scholarship as you would get. So, so if you're looking at like, is it conservative and good versus liberal and not good? It's all the way over here, conservative and good, okay? So, you know, Grobberg is, is a very good scholar. There's no reservation or concern from reading. It's not like it's a gray area. Um, I'm offering okay. the caveat only because at the end of the day, when you're interpreting history, uh, you know, yeah, everyone has their interpretation. So, you know, just like with the reflection read, it's going to be something you disagree with. You know, so that, that's my caveat. Maybe let me take a step back. I'm not trying to, to scare anyone or try to say like, hey, I'm just offering the caveat there in, in case I were to, because this is going on YouTube. So let's say I do my own research and I, and I, and I come back later on, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give an example where I'm like, okay, I disagree with that, you know? So yeah, so I, is that making more sense or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm following it in. Like, here's my point. If I would suggest C.S. Lewis, if I would suggest Rabbi Sakarias, it's like I'm sold out to this kind of authors. Yeah, so but, you would, the same thing. But, but you would still, I mean, I listen to Rabbi Zacharias and I'm like, that's <laughs> great. I disagree with that. So, I mean, like, you're always going to disagree, right? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all my comment there. No, it's Thank good. You for that. Yeah, no. And, and Alex, let me emphasize, I really appreciate the, that, that, that comment and, and that, that brings clarity. I want to emphasize this. Blomberg is a conservative scholar. You can trust what he says. If we didn't, if CGST, if I didn't mm -hmm. trust what they said, we would not be reading him, okay? I'm just offering the caveat. Of course. I'm like an attorney. Well, wait, it's, I'm just, it's the fine print at the bottom. <laughs> so, and then the big... Thank you. Yeah, the, yeah. Thank you, too. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. And, and, and again, the big reason is that this is going on YouTube, and so it will be in the public sphere and so we do need to be very cautious in our words but alex your point is well taken and um yeah it, this is a very good resource i want to emphasize that blomberg is good um yeah so great it's actually it's 904 so we have two options it's late we can just continue this next week and call it a night it's we've already been going for three hours um Let's do that. I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the decision. Let's 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 uh, let's call this tonight. We'll finish this. This lecture will only be for this discussion will be maybe for for 10, 15 minutes or maybe 20 minutes. So let's just pick it up next week. Okay, it's already 9:04. Okay, um, we need to give the homework for next week. So let me let me skip to the end of the, the PowerPoint. Homework for next week. Homework for next week. We're going to end the session tonight. This will be homework for next week. Okay, so this is for. TH100 and TH502 students. We'll pick up the history of interpretation next week. We're, we're okay. We're okay still. Um, so your assignment, and I'm going to post this tonight or early tomorrow morning. Your assignment for this week is everyone has picked, everyone has selected a passage of scripture. I will do your homework and I will confirm the passage of scripture that you've chosen. Okay. Um, if you haven't, get it to me as soon as you can. Once I confirm that passage of scripture, your assignment is to read the biblical book in which it's contained. So let's say you choose Romans chapter 8, verse 39. Your goal for next week is to read the book of Romans. <laughs> okay? So one time. So it can be in your devotions. If you pick a short book or whatever. Um, if you picked a super long book, come talk to me, but I think everyone's picked one between eight and 15 chapters. So if you've picked whatever it is, I want you to read through your book and you can read it in English. You can read it in Tagalog. You can read it in Waray Waray. You can read it in Cebuano. Okay. But I just want you to read through that book, reading specifically uh, in relationship to your text. So I want you to be thinking about your text as you read through it. Okay. Uh, number, number two, uh, number two, number three. 
uh, download five commentaries on your book, on your text, from Theology on the Web, CCEL, or, uh, or others, okay? So I want, there's, there's for sure multiple commentaries on Theology on the Web. There's commentaries on CCEL, CCEL and that's, on, that's in your cloud resource. You can look for it there. It's, um, um, specifically, for sure, pulpit commentary, uh, John Calvin, Matthew Henry, or others, okay? Again, I want to emphasize to, 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 to um, Alex's point, uh, John Calvin, things we don't agree with, or, or there's some things you might not agree with, but, but we all have a mind. There's a lot of good things he wrote. He's done a lot of, he's done a lot of um, uh, uh, work that's still being used today. I do want to make one of it because Alex is going to raise his hand. Um, uh, concerning, concerning, uh, what? Well, Alex, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay, Tim. I'm always fascinated whenever you mention John Calvin because you know I have a celebration with John Calvin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, but, but, okay. yeah. So, 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 yeah, pick, pick some commentaries and, and you can even pick ones you disagree with. Part of this process is I want you to, to, to develop your critical thinking. You are leaders. You need to identify good teaching and bad teaching. And again, that's in the context of the spirit. So, so I want five commentaries. You're going to read some things and you're going to disagree with it. Um, and so I want five commentaries though, and then extra credit. Two journal articles related to your text. If you do that, extra credit. Okay, so I will give you bonus. All right. So that, that's the assignment for next week. That's about the the two journals. Yeah. Do I do we only download the the title of the journals or the contents of the journals or yeah. commentaries on the journals or what? Yeah. So so download the commentary for your. It's for your study. It's for your benefit. Just list the journal name and the author. Okay. So I know, but the, the journal article, it, it needs to be related to your text. So it should be related to your text, okay? And I'll assess. If it's not, if you just pick two journal articles, Scion. So it has to be related. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, all right. And then, so that's for TH100. That's, that's all your homework, okay? And if you don't want to do the journal articles, fine. No, no problem. That's extra credit, okay? Now, for uh, the next, for, for if you're in TH502, you also have your second reading report, okay? So... Second reading report, who makes up the rules? Uh, an introduction to hermeneutics, that's the book. And then there's two chapters, defining the rules and basic guide to interpreting the Bible. Now, Munger Kapitid, I will post this again on, on Facebook groups. I'll email Koya Bullboy. Um, this book is on Google Books. These chapters are on Google Books. Literally, you, you go to Google Books and then you search the, the you search basic guide to interpreting the Bible, and the book is there for your for your reading, okay? So Google Books has these resources. Um, so I'm thinking about if you need help or you can Facebook message me, um, but if at all possible, do it before next Tuesday, okay? So, but let's really start practicing using these resources. Google Books has so many resources and it's free. <laughs> So they might not have the whole book, but they have part of the book. Here they have the part of the book that you need. Okay, so um, that's the homework. That's the homework for, for next week. And um, reach out to me versus Facebook Messenger, Viber, or text me, email. And um, I hope that this was beneficial. We'll finish History of Interpretation next week. And um, we'll be doing some more, uh, going into some more of these methods. And, and I really hope that, you know, maybe you won't agree with everything that you hear, but I really hope that, that, that we can all learn and we can grow. I'm learning a lot. I have learned so much, especially in, in, in the, the, the history of interpretation reading. I've learned a lot. We all need to be learning. And um, uh, yeah, and so I hope that this class and this, these courses are a blessing to you. Any questions or comments before we pray ourselves out? Vaughn has a question. Um, but well, where's Bon at? Let me find Bon. I see you. Just hang on one second. I, okay, go ahead, Bon. Ha, ha, uh, wait. Wait. Can can anybody hear me? Yeah, Hello? we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, here's my question. Can is it reliable to 
to search anything any question from gutquestions.org yeah so great question and i think alex asked me asked me the same question and i i totally uh forgot to respond to you alex so my apologies um and it just came up it's now okay. um, so gotquestions.org i just briefly looked at it it seemed to be a good resource the, 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 i don't want us to be going there just because it, it is there are some resources on the internet that are really for like a basic level and so they're very beneficial but because we're in a formal uh, educational setting, I want us to level up. So we always, you always have got questions. You can use that in your church, absolutely. Um, do, I mean, do be careful. I'm not giving a blanket because maybe some questions you would disagree with or maybe they're wrong. You know, I haven't researched it. But I did just briefly go to the website and, and it, it does seem to be for a, a more lay level basic. And so definitely, you know, look to use it in your church possibly, but for this level, I want us to focus a little bit, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. So, great question, Bon. Um, Sonny asked the question: Can we use commentaries we own? Yes, you can use any other commentary that you own. If you find another commentary somewhere else, absolutely. You find another book, even just shoot me an email, like, "Hey, I found this book. Can I use it?" Absolutely. I, I want us to be searching we're searchers we're, you know we need to find those good resources okay so absolutely you can use your commentaries if you find something else yes 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 and if it's a good if it's a good a, a, an archive that's not mentioned it's a good send me the information and we'll spread it around we'll spread around the well okay any other questions or comments okay it's late thank you all for attending um I'm so happy that, that we have power and this was a great time. And um, I just thank you for your, your patience and faithfulness. Uh, Wearsby, Wearsby, um, Danny, Wearsby. Uh, I, will per Wearsby I will permit Wearsby in the application section when you're preparing your homiletical sermon. But for, for Wearsby, Wearsby is, um, I, do want to, I do want you still to find five um, because I know you have them. <laughs> I know Danny has them. He has them already. I want, I want us to be focusing on the online resources. So you can use your other resources. You can use Wearsby in your homiletic portion, but I want us to be this I want us to become searchers of the internet. This is the future. This is the future. So um, you can use Wearsby, but um, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's stick to the online. Um, Puya Danny, can you can you this was a, a desire of Danny for a long time. Can you go ahead and close us in prayer? Uh, loving Father, we thank you for uh, this uh, class tonight. I really am so grateful, Lord, personally, that uh, this is an answered prayer, that we had this opportunity to learn from uh, an expert that you have provided through team, that we are able to uh, level up and be really get serious uh, in studying your word so that we can be able to impart this to others also, that we may be able to reach out uh, to more uh, people who need who needs uh, salvation. Because it is your desire that, uh, none, that none should perish. So Lord, uh, we continue to pray that uh, you give uh, us strength, the uh, commitment, and uh, the resources, the encouragement, and uh, we pray also that the uh, uh, team would, uh, uh, you give uh, more strength and wisdom to team to help us uh, in this undertaking. So Lord, uh, we give you all the glory for all of this, and because it's your plan, it will prosper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we go, I just want to close on this. Before we go, number one. As you leave tonight, it's easy to be afraid or to be, I want you to believe, I want you to trust that God will bring you through this, that, that you will trust in Jesus because no doubt you're stressed, maybe you're, you're scared. The Lord will bring you through this, number one. Number two, uh, uh, as we study the word, as we look at interpretation, may we worship the, 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 the debates, it's because the word is so deep. We can never exhaust it. That's why there's so many debates. It's not simple. It, it is simple enough to be understood by a child. 
I'll just end on this. I'll end on this. Um, uh, they say that it's like a swimming pool. It's it's shallow enough for the for the child to crawl. It's deep enough for the elephant to swim. I, I really want us to see that 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 the interpretation, the history of interpretation, the hermeneutical method, it's deep, it's shallow, and and we, we this should just cause great worship in our in our lives. And then. Mung said, all of us need to confess and repent from our bad interpretations <laughs> or maybe our laziness and just throwing something together sometimes. We need to level up, all of us. I need to let, we all need to level up. Uh, we should not be looking back at our accomplishments. We should be looking, how can we improve? So all of us need to be improving in some area. And then lastly, may we obey. May we obey the word of God. And so I just want to close with that. And I want to encourage you.